Well, President Obama is absolutely responsible for a major breakthrough, a historic breakthrough uh, in U.S. policy uh, towards Cuba. Uh, it's almost two years now since he and Raul Castro simultaneously announced that they had agreed to a, a prisoner exchange uh, and that this was opening the door to uh, normalize diplomatic relations and Obama pledged to uh, advance the overall relationship economically, culturally as well. And he has made good on that promise. Cuba and the United States have opened their embassies uh, over the last two years in Washington and Havana. President Obama has gone to Cuba. I was part of the White House press corps that went with him last March. Uh, he has used the powers of the executive to uh, open the floodgates of, of commerce uh, and travel, uh, building bridges culturally, economically, politically between Cuba and the United States. And I think President Obama learned the lessons of the long history of secret talks with Cuba. Cuba doesn't uh, respond to demands, doesn't respond to arrogant imperial, an arrogant imperial approach to uh, the United States throwing its power around. Um, uh, the revolution was to be independent and, uh, and uh, the Cuban leadership, the Castros, uh, held uh, to that uh, principle. And Obama understood that um, he couldn't simply demand or dictate uh, to the Cubans and that he had to uh, adopt a uh, respectful tone uh, in dialogue with the Cubans. And uh, for these last two years since the breakthrough uh, in relations, he has held, I think, to that respectful tone and to continuing to use the powers of the presidency uh, to advance um, U.S.-Cuban uh, relations. Um, how irreversible this is, is difficult to say now that we have a very different kind of president coming into office uh, in January. Um, but um, for now, President Obama's main foreign policy legacy, besides the extraordinary deal with Iran, is the breakthrough in relations with Cuba. The United States of America has already advanced its own major interests, uh, not just in relations with, with Cuba, but in relations with Latin America and the rest of the world through uh, civil, uh, uh, civilized, normal relations uh, with Cuba. Um, White House officials have pointed to the uh, agreement uh, to end hostilities in Colombia between the FARC and the Colombian government uh, as an example of what normal relations with Cuba could bring. As you may know, Cuba hosted those talks uh, between the, the FARC uh, uh, guerrilla leadership and the Colombian government in Havana. Um, the rest of Latin America, I think, has taken clear uh, note of the new U.S. approach to Cuba. So Cuba is no longer a kind of a regional issue uh, in U.S.-Latin American relations. U.S. businesses uh, have expanded in terms of their relations uh, to, to Cuba, particularly the travel industry, the hotel industry now has a foothold uh, in Havana, all part of a, a process um, engineered, pushed forward by President Obama to expand our, our, our relations. On the Cuban side, they, for the moment at least, no longer live under the uh, historic uh, kind of existential threat of the Colossus of the North uh, because they have had a, a president in Obama who uh, has said very explicitly, we are no longer in the business of trying to overthrow the Cuban government, of trying to intervene uh, militarily, paramilitarily, um, uh, economically and politically and otherwise in Cuban affairs. We want to have a civil dialogue with Cuba. We want to have a normal relationship with Cuba. And we think that that relationship will eventually have an impact on Cuban society and Cuban and the Cuban political system, but uh, that our, our intent is not to uh, intervene in Cuban affairs. Uh, so for the Cubans, uh, the tone of their relationship with the United States has changed. The national security threat uh, with the United States has essentially uh, changed. Um, uh, and of course, commercially and economically, having uh, U.S. tourists uh, come to Cuba and U.S. businesses come to Cuba uh, has helped Cuba start to evolve its economy in a way that Raul Castro said it needed to evolve with a small but growing private sector, particularly in the, in the tourism area. Um, uh, supported and expanded by uh, US, a U.S. presence, whether it's a presence of tourists or a presence of travelers or a presence of, 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 of American businesses, that process has 
started and anybody who's been traveling to Cuba regularly over the last uh, 10 years or so has seen uh, the impact that this evolution has had on, on the Cuban economy and on the Cuban society. So there are two scenarios, a good scenario and a very bad scenario. The good scenario is that Trump, the businessman, and of course he rose to the presidency arguing that he was the best, uh, the greatest businessman of all, and he would bring a business executive's kind of management style to the United States of America. The best scenario is that Trump, the businessman, will understand uh, that uh, normal uh, business, cultural and political relations with Cuba is in the best business interests of the United States of America. And what's good for business, of course, as businessmen like to say, is good for America. Uh, Trump, as we know from investigative reporting during the uh, election campaign, actually secretly sent emissaries to Cuba in the 1990s to see if uh, he could kind of get a foothold for casino interests uh, that he had in Atlantic City uh, in Havana. Uh, he circumvented the embargo, apparently illegally, uh, to do this. Uh, so we know that he has been interested in business in the past, and now, of course, he's going to be president of the United States at a time when, in fact, um, Cuba is, quote-unquote, open for business uh, of, of, of this type, uh, whether they would agree. Uh, obviously, as president, he's not going to have Trump casinos uh, being developed in, in Cuba now, but I think he certainly understands uh, the power of American commerce and American business interests uh, and has the option to continue with what Barack Obama and Raul Castro have started, which is a, 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 a commercial, economic opening and diplomatic um, ties with uh, Cuba. The bad scenario, which can get very dark, is that Donald Trump will use the bully pulpit of the presidency to truly be a bully towards Cuba and to try and bully Cuba into doing what he wants. Uh, uh, he went to Miami to try and get Cuban-American votes, and to an extent he succeeded, stating that uh, all the progress that Barack Obama had made in normalizing relations with Cuba could be reversed by executive order and that he was president. He would reverse those orders until Cuba gave us a better deal. One of the things that Barack Obama understood from the history uh, that is in this book, Back Channel to Cuba, uh, is that you don't do quid pro quos, you don't do deals. The Cubans don't do deals. Uh, and Obama basically said, I'm going to take unilateral actions on, on Cuba. He said this to Raul Castro. Uh, and um, you can respond if you want, and if you don't, uh, you don't. Um, and he didn't make any demands. He didn't say tit for tat. He didn't say, you know, I'm going to do this and then you're going to do that. He didn't demand uh, what uh, Bill Clinton called calibrated response. Uh, or what Henry Kissinger called uh, reciprocity. Um, he basically said, this is the best interest of the United States for us to move forward. Would you hope that you move with us? And the Cubans, to a point, have moved with us in improving normal relations, which they always said they wanted, um, and normal commercial relations uh, as, as well. They would like to see the embargo fully lifted. Uh, and, uh, but the dark scenario is, is, that Obama, is that Donald Trump will set aside the lessons of civility and make demands and start to push his weight and the weight of the United States around in an imperial, arrogant fashion for which, frankly, he's known. Uh, and that the Cubans will respond uh, predictably. Uh, their nationalist sentiments will be uh, stimulated. Uh, they will respond angrily and defensively and nationalistically. Uh, they will remind the United States that the revolution means that uh, Cuba will not be pushed around by the Colossus of the North. Uh, and uh, the rhetoric could easily get heated very quickly. And the fear, of course, that we who follow the work on Cuba issues have is that a thin-skinned, arrogant, imperially-minded president of the United States uh, will quickly escalate the hostile tenor of the rhetoric and then the policy uh, towards uh, Cuba, and that the very clear effort that President Obama and the Obama administration made to adopt a civil, even, sober, uh, diplomatic tone in U.S.-Cuban relations will get kind of thrown out the window.
throughout the history of U.S.-Cuban relations, which is dominated by U.S. imperial aggression, you know, the Bay of Pigs invasion, CIA efforts to assassinate Fidel Castro, the embargo to try and uh, basically strangle the Cuban economy and Cuban society, um, that history has been accompanied by uh, secret talks between almost every president and Fidel and Raul Castro for over 55 years. Uh, and because of the political sensitivity uh, of these talks, um, many of the, much of the dialogue has been conducted secretly uh, and often through intermediaries, some of them quite famous like Gabriel Garcia Marquez or even former President Jimmy Carter uh, who served as an intermediary between Fidel Castro and Bill Clinton in the 1990s. Um, so President Obama used two of his top White House aides, Benjamin Rhodes uh, and Ricardo Suniga of the National Security Council, uh, to secretly meet with a Cuban delegation uh, in Canada, in Rome, one other country, the identity of which is still a secret, um, for almost uh, two years. And um, the Cuban delegation was made up of people very close, and I mean very close, to Raul Castro. One of the things that President-elect Donald Trump will probably be told uh, in the coming weeks as the transition goes forward is the status quo of, of that back-channel situation, who they've been talking to, what they're talking about at this point. Um, and I'm sure that the Cubans are sending messages that they want to get to the incoming administration that they are willing to continue the same process of normalization uh, that has gone so far forward with the Obama administration. One of the things this book that I've done with William Leo Grant shows is that Fidel Castro sent a kind of con olive branch of sorts to almost every incoming president saying, we are interested in normal relations. If you respect our sovereignty, we can talk about just about anything. And I would assume a very similar message is coming through that back channel process uh, for the uh, uh, incoming Trump administration. How Trump will handle the, and use this back channel, which is in, still in place, um, certainly remains to be seen. Uh, he went to Florida during the campaign to get Cuban-American hardline votes. He promised them that he would rescind all the executive orders that President Obama had put in place to open uh, the door to better relations, which means he was going to try and shut the door, presumably, uh, and then start negotiations all over again. Whether he really does that uh, remains to be seen. There are quite a few Cuban-American business interests in Florida that would be hurt if uh, if relations now uh, went negatively instead of more positively. Uh, so there will be a lot for him, for President Trump, uh, to uh, consider. Um, so there's potential for better relations to continue forward, but there's also great dangers uh, that relations could sour in this next administration.